It is now my pleasure to turn the webcast over to Dr. Peter Hurst, Executive Director, MIT Sloan Executive Education. Dr. Hurst, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ezra. Welcome, everybody, to uh, what I believe is the 10th in our Innovation at Work webinar series from MIT Sloan Executive Education, uh, where we bring you uh, content and ideas from some of our faculty who teach in our executive education uh, programs. We have over 2,000 people registered for this webinar today. I think that's a record, so welcome to you all, wherever you may be in the world. I hope it's a little less snowy and cold than we are here uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, Ed Schiappa, uh, Professor Ed Schiappa, uh, is uh, a, a faculty member at, at MIT uh, who teaches in uh, our uh, Communication and Persuasion in the Digital Age Executive Education course. Uh, he's also a professor and head of Comparative Media Studies and Writing in, MIT Sloan, in MIT's School of Humanities and Social Sciences. Uh, this is a new course that uh, Ed has created with us in the last year. We're very excited about it, and I'm even more excited that uh, today Ed is joining us to really focus in on one particular aspect uh, of uh, this idea of communication uh, and persuasion. And with that, I would like to hand over the microphone to Ed and take it away, please. Well, thank you, Peter. You know, I'm, I'm kind of looking at this slide here, and the picture of me is, uh, is a, a little odd looking. You know, maybe the way to get started here is since we have so many people with us helping us right now, uh, they can help me make a decision because I really need to update the photo on my web page. And so if you will look at the slide, folks, we're going to push out a little poll question here, and you can see the four pictures available, uh, A, B, C, and D. And you know, maybe you could give me your advice on which one you think would be uh, the best one for me to use on uh, my website. Could, could everybody just take a minute to, to fill out that poll? Great, and then um, Ezra, if you could show us the results of that poll, I'd be interested in seeing what people have to say. Whoa, okay, very interesting, very interesting. So as you can see there, uh, the vast majority of people preferred um, photo C, um, and uh, with, a, with A coming in a somewhat distant second, and then the B and D really coming in last. Now, Peter, it's not practical for me to, to interview the people who answered that poll, mm -hmm. but I'm wondering if I could use you as a sort of a one-person focus group. Sure. Why do you think they went with, with C? Uh, I would say C looks uh, professional, uh, serious, still approachable. Um, I think that uh, B and D, which came last uh, in B, you look rather startled <laughs> uh, and, and sort of uh, not very approachable. In D, uh, I think maybe you look rather rather informal. Uh, and actually, I, I, I might have voted for A as well, but perhaps your your, your dress is a little casual compared to for a professional uh, headshot. Now let me let me ask you just a quick follow-up question there because um, I, I agree with everything you said there, but one of the things that judgments, one of the judgments you were able to make virtually immediately is which photo looked most professional. But now you haven't been trained in that. It's just something you in, more or less, uh, I won't say instinctively because it's not an instinct, but it's a learned habit of recognizing what is a professional uh, looking photograph. And I think what you said was is that um, photo C looked professional, it looked serious, yet approachable. Is, mm -hmm. is, is there any other connotations for you that the term professional implies, or is that pretty much it? Uh, I, I, I guess co I would add competent perhaps to that as well, but okay. you know, that's okay. sort of an, an inference that I make from that, which you know, on, on no basis other than just looking at it. But that's exactly how it works, right. is we do make inferences um, based on uh, images which are far um, uh, less data, basically. Uh, we're, we're making a lot of inferences. We're supplying a lot of information based on the limited data that's coming from the photograph. So photograph A, which came in second, um, doesn't score quite as well for you 
Um, probably on those things that you said earlier, might it come across, since I'm uh, laughing in that picture, that I'm not quite as serious, and might that also connote less competence? Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, some, some very interesting things that we do there. Everyone made a relatively snap judgment, uh, though we had a, a, an interesting variety of judgments. The other thing that I want to mention about photograph D is, because uh, I'm going to come back and talk later about the classic head tilt. So if people will just kind of notice the way that my head is tilting in photograph D. Photograph D is the, actually the only photograph here that I made for this lecture. All the others are actually <clears throat> can be found in other places in the web at some point or another. All right, so the point that I want to make, and this is going to be one of the major themes we're going to talk about today, uh, is how we express our identity non-verbally. Because communication always begins with a sender, somebody who is sending out the message. And that's true if you are communicating with someone face-to-face -face, uh, or over the phone or over the video, a video or on a web presence. And your identity, however you represent that, verbally, visually, um, is the leading edge, if you will, of your message. It's part of your message. Um, and that's something that we're going to see throughout today's uh, comments. So there are basically, I want to start with three initial lessons that are important for people to think about in terms of visual persuasion in the digital age. Number one is to think of visual and verbal literally as different media, different channels of communication into people's minds, if you will. Now we know that language, verbal language, is persuasive. Any utterance is encouraging you to understand some little aspect of the world in a particular way. All language use is partial in that sense. And uh, all language use that we understand also tends to encourage some kind of response. So if I describe a tree being cut down as uh, environmental destruction, you're going to react to that differently than if I talk about it as if it were economic development. So verbal language is always persuasive. And that's an, an issue that I won't go into in any greater depth here, but uh, certainly in the q and if people want to know, I can give them a whole book that I basically wrote on that, on that particular topic. Uh, and you can see in this particular slide a series of words, angry man, for example. Um, but we, above it, we have um, visual images. And just as all verbal language is persuasive in one way or another, so too are visual messages, at least if we understand them. And by the way, uh, I'm going to be referring occasionally to visual language, uh, both in terms of semantics, like we do the meaning of words, or grammar, syntax, the way we put words together. And we'll see that they have an analog when it comes to visual persuasion. And so visual images are, um, if understood in the same way that language has to be understood, um, are, is persuasive. So the reason I say that is because there, uh, for people who, who do not understand English, what I'm saying right now is not going to be persuasive. And that too has an analog in visual images. If you don't understand certain aspects of the visual image that you're experiencing, uh, it's not going to have a, a persuasive effect. And we'll look at some specific examples of, as of, of that as we progress through uh, the lecture. Now the reason that visual persuasion is so important is that different parts of the brain uh, in, are involved in processing images versus words. And we are constantly bombarded by visual stimuli. And we decode or comprehend the, that visual stimuli very rapidly and without much thought. So for example, earlier when I asked Peter about the opening slides or opening pictures, he was, very, was able to make a snap judgment and uh, decode, if you will, four different images um, with relatively little effort and time. So I'd like to do the same thing very briefly here. These are two pictures of a friend of mine, uh, John Kirby, who's a professor down at the University of Miami. Um, and I, I'd like to ask you, if I can call on you again, Peter, uh, you know, which, which one of these photos do you prefer for, say, a professional web presence for, for John Kirby and, and why? OK. 
Can I put you on the spot there? Sure, you can. I, I think I, I find this one a little more difficult to call. It would depend, perhaps, on, on on the application. I find the one on the left, which is a little lighter, uh, to be very friendly and approachable. And so, perhaps, if I was interested in sort of a sales, interacting with someone in a sales role, that might appeal to me. Uh, I think the photo on the bottom right, actually, your friend looks a little almost devious to me in that one. <laughs> Uh, and, and so, you know, maybe there'd be some circumstances where that would be appropriate. But if I was wanting to do business, perhaps I prefer the uh, the top left person. Okay. You know, um, one thing that I have found over the years is that your familiarity with a particular subject matter being portrayed really does influence how you decode it. So, for example, when I look at that photo on the lower right hand corner, for me over the years, I've always thought of it, of him looking rather coy in that uh, photograph. Um, but I've, I've shared these images with a number of groups of people over the year, and the, the term, you know, uh, demonic or uh, slightly uh, devilish, um, which, by the way, might be also on target, if you know John, uh, you know, has, has come out a lot. Some of that has to do with uh, it is a darker image, and his uh, eyes are somewhat darkened in particular. Um, but the other thing that I would call your attention to is that photograph on the left is a very direct gaze. It is engaging you as an equal um, and, and speaking to you, again, as an equal. Whereas on the, the other one, there's something going on. And part of what that something is may be affected, like, you, like I said, whether you know John or not, but is, is affected by the fact that it's a head, that there's once again a head tilt. Um, and that the eyes in particular are portrayed uh, differently. Now, later on in today's conversation, I am going to encourage people to think about um, their own photographs and their own images that they represent themselves with in their work environment and particularly on the web. But this conversation about my friend John here reminds us that we may not be our best audience for analyzing the meaning of a particular image. John might like that image on the right um, because he sees certain things there um, that other people may not. And so it's important when assessing the meaning of your images that you put on the web to represent yourself that you have some you know, unbiased people uh, who are willing to be frank with you about um, what they mean to them and what they are getting, um, getting out of those particular images. Okay, so uh, the operational concept here, that I, the theoretical concept that I want to mention here is the notion of dual coding. Our brains have to uh, essentially operate at two levels, that we process verbal and nonverbal stimuli, but we do so differently. And we are sometimes not as consciously aware of the kind of work that nonverbal messages may be doing to us as we are verbal messages. We know when, if you will, a salesperson comes up and says, I'd like you to be interested in this product or this service. Um, but when we're watching television or surfing the, the web or whatever, um, visual images are just sort of, we often categorize that in our heads as entertainment. And therefore, uh, it, they, those messages have the opportunity to do work to on us, if you will, that we may not be uh, consciously aware of without taking some effort to realize, oh yeah, they are after all trying to sell us something. All right, the second theme that I want to emphasize is that you know we've established that visual and verbal are two different media. Uh, visual is king in the digital era. That's the second point. You know, for a, a long period of time here, we've been influenced by Gutenberg's invention of the printing press. And there are some theorists who have argued that, that uh, with the 21st century, late 20th and early 21st century, we have now closed what has been described as the Gutenberg parentheses, and that we have moved to a period of, of uh, where verbal and the printed word are not as king as they used to be. And that's sort of the argument that I'm making here, is that visual is often king in the digital era. Now, our cognitive load, that is to say how much our brain has to be engaged, is actually similar with aural, that is to say what we hear, and visual stimuli. You know, we have sense organs. They have to do a certain amount of work with our brain to uh, comprehend the world around us. Um, however, visual memory is stronger. 
And that's where learning takes place, right? That's where uh, reprogramming, if you will, happens is at the level of memory. If you've ever learned how to play piano, you know you had to do finger exercises. Well, uh, hearing the same message, seeing the same message, uh, and in, in, uh, burning that into our memory, if you will, uh, is easier to do with visual messages. And as a result, is a stronger tool, if you will, of learning. It's, it's stronger and more accurate than auditory, what we hear, oral memory. So that's lesson number two that I want to emphasize, and I'm going to unpack a little more, which is that visual is king in the digital era. Now, what really makes this strong is when the visual uh, imagery is paired, uh, presented with what we call evocative stimuli. So that's a nice $2 word there that I want to explain a little bit, evocative stimuli. What that means is uh, stimuli, in this case visual, that evokes, that pulls out of us a particular emotional response. Okay. So evocative stimuli are images, or sometimes also with sound, music is very good at this, that pull out of us, that evoke a particular emotional response. And the reason that's important for persuasion is that you are pairing your persuasive message, your product, your service, your candidate, whatever it happens to be, with that evocative stimuli, hence establishing an emotional tie between what it is that you are promoting, persuading about, uh, and those images. We're going to see some examples of that um, in just a little bit. This concept, by the way, comes from the, the famous ad man, Tony Schwartz. Tony Schwartz wrote a book called The Responsive Chord. It's going to be on a slide at the very end in terms of further reading. And he wrote this book a, a number of decades ago, but it stands up very well. He was a pioneer in ad producing. Uh, and creator of the famous Daisy commercial. And if you don't know what the Daisy commercial is, don't worry. We're going to watch it in a little while. Um, but he was really one of the first ad people to understand the power of electronic media, television and radio in particular. If you see this picture of him, I don't know how well you can see the, the bookshelf behind him, but those shelves are all filled with a form of technology that you if you're under a certain age there in the audience today, you may not be familiar with, but it's all reel-to-reel -reel, uh, audio tape. And you know, as you can see, there are hundreds and hundreds of him behind him, and that's just a, a small portion of his um, library, which I now b believe uh, is owned by the Smithsonian. But in, when he was alive, Tony Schwartz had an incredible uh, audio library. And he is the person who understood that the way to sell products, if you will, including political candidates, uh, was not uh, best served on radio and television by providing a lot of information. You know, words are better at that. So if you, if you can get someone to read a, a written text, and that's where you provide them a lot of, of content, if you will, a lot of information about your product or candidate or whatever. But if that's not the most powerful use of radio and television. Rather, uh, to provide images, and in some cases sound that accompany those images that evoke an emotional response. And so his argument was that with electronic media, you should increase evocative stimuli, images, again, that are going to e evoke a particular emotional response. So we're going to uh, watch a commercial here for Folgers Coffee. Some of you will recognize this ad. Many of you will not. But this is a commercial that aired around Christmas time for Folgers Coffee. So we're going to watch this uh, commercial now, and then I'll talk about it after it's over. Thanks a lot. Merry Christmas. Best 
wishes for this and all your mornings from Folgers. Okay. Now, um, this was a, a very successful commercial uh, for its time, and uh, I want to talk a little bit about about it. First of all, note what was and wasn't said. There's really no content, no claims at all uh, offered here about their product. Uh, they never, nobody ever comes on screen and claims that Folgers coffee tastes good or Folgers coffee um, smells good, although that is actually implied at one particular point. Rather, a, a story is told that is designed to elicit a very specific emotional response. And uh, it is certainly not uniquely American, but it is particularly American in the sense of uh, many viewers would recognize this as the, you know, the college student has come home uh, from college and turned into a strapping 30-year-old, it looks like to me. But I think it's supposed to be a college student um, to visit for the holidays just in time, and uh, that's why the family is so uh, joyous and seeing him and he you know, uh, reconnects with his uh, siblings. Um, the, the whole scene is filmed through a very uh, soft focus, which itself connotes uh, an emotional kind of environment um, that's very different than if it was not a, a soft focus. Uh, very recognizable characters for most uh, viewers. And uh, music, of course, that also supports the emotional arc of the story, if you will. So this is a very good example of what we're talking about when we refer to evocative stimuli. Uh, and the idea that Schwartz had is the next time that somebody's walking down the aisle of their grocery store and they see that container of uh, Folgers coffee, that's the association they're going to have with that, is that sort of you know, warm feeling that was encouraged by this particular video. Uh, you notice, by the way, that um, the Folgers coffee, when it was opened, was full, and you saw the front of the can, just as you would in the grocery store, and that's also the way that the ad ended, was again showing you the image of the product as you would see it in the grocery store. That's designed to establish that link uh, between the emotions that the ad was creating um, and the product. So moving on to the third lesson that I want to talk about um, and have you take away from today is that mediated identity is real identity. So when we talk about knowing someone through the mass media, my point is going to be, and I'm going to illustrate this over the next few slides, is that we feel like we know that person or that character pretty much the same way that we would know a real person. Now, we have almost, you know, uh, there's 2,000 people registered and, and a large number of people listening in right now. So it's, the odds are pretty good that somebody out there uh, has actually met President Obama, but uh, most of us have not. Nonetheless, uh, I think it's safe to say that we all have a lot of attitudes about Barack Obama, that we feel like we know him because we experience him so often through the mass media. Now, I have two other characters on there. Uh, in the middle there, you see Harry Potter, who I think, uh, I, I think would be recognized internationally at this point as a character. And particularly if you've read all the books or you've seen at least a few of the movies, maybe even only one of the movie, you have a lot of attitudes and um, you know, emotional responses to, to, to that character. Now, the last one is Big Bird. Now, Big Bird is primarily American, but not exclusively. There are Big Birds in some other public television um, stations uh, across the world right now. But that's one that some people might look at and have no clue who Big Bird is, let alone have any idea about what Big Bird's personality is. But my, my point generally here is that we do get to know people, whether those people are fictional or not, or and let's add birds to the general category of people here just for the moment, uh, that we can develop attitudes. Well, what kind of attitudes and judgments am I talking about? Well, one is that our research has shown that we make the same judgments about mediated personalities as we do real people when we meet them in life is attractiveness. And that's a judgment, again, that is a snap judgment. 
we, it takes us about two seconds to be able to rate someone on a scale of attractiveness. Now, just in case, you know, I, I realize Shrek may be getting to be a little bit of a dated example right now, but we have a fictional character of Shrek on the left-hand side and George Clooney from a few years ago, but still looking pretty good uh, on the right. And it's pretty easy to say that you could go anywhere over the world and have people make a fairly instantaneous rating of their attractiveness, even though they may only know them, again, through the media. So attractiveness is an example of a judgment that we make instantly based on purely visual information. Trustworthiness is a, another quality that we are able to make about mediated identities. And uh, we can do that even with a single photograph, but it gets even stronger if we have sort of multiple mediated experiences of a person. So in this case, I've got uh, Colbert on the, the right-hand side and a fictional character, Voldemort, on the left-hand side. But again, if somebody knows these people, uh, that is to say has experienced them through the mass media, um, I have no question at all in my mind that they have made a judgment that could be, if you will, quantified uh, as to how trustworthy that they find them uh, to be. And that's one of the things that we've done in our research is that we've asked people how trustworthy they find uh, certain real world characters, uh, political candidates, for example, and fictional characters. And we find that people are able to make the same kind of judgments consistently uh, and that those judgments in turn correlate with other kinds of judgments that they might make uh, on a variety of issues. A third example of the kind of judgment that we make with mediated identities is likability. Likability, which may not surprise you, uh, also tends to correlate fairly highly with attractiveness. We tend to like attractive people. Um, and again, here I have a couple of examples of, of people that if you recognize them, you no doubt already have judgments about their likability. On the left is Ellen DeGeneres, who has in recent years consistently scored as one of the most likable Hollywood uh, celebrities. And uh, she's been around now for, for several decades, so uh, if you're at all uh, experienced with at least uh, U.S. television, I don't really know if her show is, is shown outside of that, then she's someone who people have formed a judgment about. On the right, of course, is New Jersey Governor uh, Christie. Um, I added this slide, by the way, uh, right after the um, controversy that broke out when um, certain bridge delays became uh, public. And so now that's a little bit of personal knowledge, right, about uh, Christie's office being implicated with deliberately causing uh, traffic problems. Um, I've never met the man, but there's no question that what I've learned about him and see him uh, visually uh, is going to influence my judgments about whether or not we, I find him likable or not. So likability is a third kind of judgment that we can make very quickly based on mediated contact. The last one, interestingly enough, is predictability. Once we get to know a mediated character, um, we find ourselves able to increase our confidence about how to predict that they will behave. And that's actually an important variable. It correlates back, I noticed, uh, commented earlier that attractiveness correlates with likability. Predictability tends to correlate with trustworthiness. So to present a consistent media uh, persona that is both predictable uh, and provided as, presented as uh, trustworthy are strongly reinforcing. In this particular case, we have uh, Santa Claus as, you know, he's known in the U.S., other names in other countries, and of course, Vladimir Putin on the right-hand side. Uh, both of these mediated characters here are winking at us, but perhaps what that means will differ depending on your previous knowledge and experience of those particular characters. And again, these are relatively easy things to uh, measure, by the way. We've done surveys where we've, again, presented real life and fictional characters and asked them a series of items about uh, whether or not you think you can predict what, they, uh, predict what they're going to do, if you understand why they do the things they kind of do, things that correlate with the notion of predictability. And it's quite easy to do very quickly and with purely mediated identities. So I'm going to put you on the spot again, Peter. And uh, 
I'm going to give you, present you an image here of a couple who, of course, you've never met before. Um, so all you have to work with here is this particular picture. And you can take a second and you can see the, the big slab of, of uh, delicious ribs that uh, they have there. And, and uh, uh, you know, if you had to conjecture, what would you say about these, these two people? Uh, it looks to me like they're a couple uh, and that they're very friendly and welcoming and inviting and offering me some very tasty looking food, but, uh, which I wouldn't hesitate to eat. Uh, I certainly wouldn't be concerned that there was anything untoward about the offer, that, that they don't look like they're trying to sell me anything, they don't look like they're trying to poison me. If you had to guess anything about their sort of, uh, I don't know, socioeconomic or educational status, is there anything you would infer from this picture? Uh, I guess in, a, in so maybe this is a little parochial, but I, to me they look like they might be sort of retired uh, in the U.S. They probably moved to somewhere nice and sunny in the south by the look of it. Um, well, some of your instincts there are quite good. I, I will notice that they <clears throat> are my age, by the way. <laughs> um, and they, they are married, and in fact, uh, we're married as teenagers. So they've been together for a very long time. They are a, a, a couple. Um, you know, there, there are certain stereotypes in uh, every country, and, and I have had some people who have looked at this image and um, described them as looking a bit redneck. Um, which I, I don't think they would find insulting, particularly because uh, Frank is actually a professor at the State University of New York uh, and is uh, chair of their communication department. And he's a, a, been a friend of mine since graduate school, um, which is now about 30 years ago. And uh, so he looks a little different. Obviously, these pictures are designed. The one on the right, I think, sort of looks a little like Thoreau. Um, and the one on the left is, is sort of his professional uh, persona, so it looks a bit different, obviously, than than you know holding a big slab of ribs. And in the background, by the way, there you can kind of make out that there was a contest, and that they apparently and they do uh, as a hobby enter barbecue contest. So, um, but again, the point here is that we we make inferences and make judgments very quickly based on visual stimuli that we have about a particular person, and we're hardwired to do that. If you think about uh, traits that have evolutionary value, the ability to figure out if somebody's friend or foe is really important. And even with a few squiggly lines, that's ready kilowatt on the left, which is a bit of a uh, uh, throwback Thursday character here. Um, and even with just a few lines on the right, you still have a character that with a little bit more, probably need a little bit more information, but I suspect I could ha ask people a series of questions that they would not just answer with, I have no idea. They would, would make assessments about whether or not they think that character, even on the right, is shady and trustworthy or, or not. Okay, so I, this first segment uh, that I've been talking about so far in terms of mastering your visual message uh, emphasizes three themes, to think of visual and verbal as different media, different channels of communication, to recognize that visual is king in the digital era, it's processed quickly, it's remembered more strongly, and thirdly, that our media, mediated identity is for all practical purposes our real identity, okay? Um, what I'd like to do is uh, ask a, a quick polling question here, which basically asks about uh, your web presence, if you will. So uh, Ezra, if you would push out that next question, that'd be great. All right, let's take a look at uh, what kind of answers we get there. All right, so interesting that 80% uh, do have a photograph of themselves online. So today's uh, presentation, I hope, will be useful both to the 80% who already have uh, a visual representation of themselves and for them to think about is it conveying the meaning that they want it to, and maybe getting a reality check on that from some candid colleagues. But it's also important for the 21% of you who don't, 
because if you have a business that has any kind of web presence, um, you know, if you want to, for people to understand that there are humans behind your particular service or, uh, and company, then it is probably a good idea to have some uh, photographs of, uh, of yourself or other people in uh, important roles in your particular company. And to think about, um, again, what kind of judgments are people going to make about attractiveness, likability, trustworthiness, and predictability? Because all of those can correlate to a, basically a positive response to you and to your particular company and uh, product. What I'd like to do here for just the last few minutes is to dig a little bit deeper to talk about uh, the semantics and syntax of visual language. As I said earlier, it has a, a strong parallel. So with syntax, you're talking about a grammar of images, how images are linked together. Very briefly, uh, one is simply linking positive or negative associations, and we're going to see that, an example of that in just a minute. Uh, secondly is you can uh, imply cause, X causes Y, and it's much easier to do that with pictures than in the real world sometimes. Third is you can, with again, with moving images, create analogies. Uh, for those of you who watch the Super Bowl and watch the Super Bowl ads in particular, I think uh, for many people their favorite was uh, that when you, when you are hungry and, and are lacking certain nutritional value, uh, you may feel like Danny Trejo, who was in that uh, Snickers commercial, uh, until you have your Snickers nutrition um, and then you're back to normal. And then lastly, uh, you can present dilemmas. You can uh, create a choice visually between X and Y. You can demonstrate visually why X is a bad idea, therefore encourage the Y option to your viewers. Um, let's watch um, the Daisy commercial. To, let me set this up very briefly. Um, this is a commercial that was run in 1964 uh, by the Lyndon Johnson campaign. This was before the United States had really uh, escalated its involvement in Vietnam. And so uh, at the time, Johnson was the candidate of restraint. And it was the Goldwater the campaign that was associated with the idea of potentially escalating the war. So let's watch this very famous, uh, really uh, one of the most famous political commercials ever viewed. Or we must die. Vote for President Johnson on November 3rd. The stakes are too high for you to stay home. Okay, so as you can see there, you know, very provocative uh, images there. It's very controversial. It was only aired once. And the, the point that I want to make, and the only point I want to make about it right now, is that Goldwater is never mentioned in that ad. There are, in fact, are no verbal claims about how Goldwater would be a dangerous candidate. It's all implied uh, and e is the emotional response that they hope would be evoked, i.e. fear, uh, associated with the candidacy of, of Goldwater. But it's a good example of an argument by association that linkage being made through the particular ad. Um, okay, so I want to go to the next example which is to show how one makes a causal argument. And this is a commercial for Zest Soap, and they have made a lot of commercials like this. And uh, let's just watch it, and then we'll talk about it as an argument. Exhausted to the extreme? You need refreshment that's extreme. It's gonna be a new Get new day. Zest Cool Extreme with refreshing mint. It wakes you, shakes you, and revives you with a cleaner rinse that's fresher than ordinary soap. New Zest Cool Extreme. Feel the mint and get refreshed. 
And now new Zest Spring Burst for 365 refreshing spring mornings. Okay, so notice there, again, very little is actually uh, said, and even if it is, that's not what you remember. What you're going to remember are the images, nice bright colors associated with this, uh, and the, the, the persistent argument that Zest has used over the years is that it will wake you up and that a good shower with zest is the best way to feel refreshed and uh, awakened. And uh, they repeat that formula in, in commercial after commercial. Um, so, and I also hope that you did notice the, the, the very bright colors and exciting, you know, sort of music that was used there because I don't want, as much as I want to emphasize the visual, I certainly don't want to underestimate the supporting role that uh, auditory soundtracks in particular can, um, can play. I'm showing you a quick list. I won't go over all of these, but in terms of how we affect the meaning of visual images, which is what I mean by semantics, there's a lot of components from costuming to the use of recognizable simplistic characters. These are all techniques that uh, we can use in whatever particular persuasive con uh, context that we happen to find ourselves in, again, always keeping the audience in mind of what these visual images will mean to them. And what I want to talk about here, this one hard, slide is a little hard to, uh, to see, but it's about overall composition effects, putting things together. For a positive uh, video, you have positive music, a soft focus, slow motion, and vocal tones, and nice colors. Or you can do the opposite. You can have very negative imagery with harsh lights, fast edits, uh, black and white, and harsh vocals, and I'm going to end today with two videos that put all of these things together that I think will kind of throw into relief all the different variables that go into a visual message. So let's start with an ad from the re-election of Ronald Reagan from 1984, and if, Ezra, if you could push that out, that'd be great. It's morning again in America. Today, more men and women will go to work than ever before in our country's history with interest rates at about half the record highs of 1980. Nearly 2,000 families today will buy new homes, more than at any time in the past four years. This afternoon, 6,500 young men and women will be married. And with inflation at less than half of what it was just four years ago, they can look forward with confidence to the future. It's morning again in America. And under the leadership of President Reagan, our country is prouder and stronger and better. Why would we ever want to return to where we were less than four short years ago? With a professionally made ad, there are no accents. And so every second of that ad is really artistry at work. You have uh, lighting, you have focus, you have music, and above all, you have recognizable characters there. And those recognizable characters are ones that the, the Reagan campaign, at least, assumed that people would care about. So a really nice example, very effective ad from 1984 uh, that shows you know, many of these components I've been talking about being put together. So let's watch one more. And in this particular case, we're going to see almost the mirror opposite here uh, and a, a flip of all of those different factors in a, a very negative ad that was produced in um, 2012. Okay. Go ahead, Ezra. Imagine a small American town two years from now if Obama is reelected. Small businesses are struggling, and families are worried about their jobs and their future. The wait to see a doctor is ever increasing. Gas prices through the roof, and their freedom of religion under attack. And every day, the residents of this town must come to grips with the harsh reality that a rogue nation and sworn American enemy has become a nuclear threat. Welcome to a place where one president's failed policies really hit home.
Welcome to Obamaville. More than a town, a cautionary tale. Coming soon to RickSantorum.com. So that commercial was put together by the Rick Santorum campaign in 2012, and, and Santorum might be running again this year. But at any rate, uh, it is a, a great example of a lot of the techniques that I'm talking about. Uh, it, you've got a, a lot of black and white. You've got fast uh, edits. Uh, again, very recognizable characters. It doesn't work if you can't recognize the characters that are being portrayed. Uh, and very different vocals and use of lighting than we saw in the Reagan ad. So two extremes there, but when you put it together, I think you can see the um, potential power of uh, a visual persuasion. Um, so I think that what I'd like to do at this point is simply sum up by what we're talking about here is called dual coding, that most messages actually combine verbal and nonverbal components. They combine words with visual images. And because visual images have a bigger impact, pictures do the most significant persuasive work when, those, uh, when, when messages are dual coded like that. And hopefully today's presentation has given you some ideas about how to understand exactly how that works. So I would encourage you as we get ready to move into a, a, a Q&A period here to think about how you could put into practice uh, one or more of the concepts that you've learned, in particular how you could uh, enhance your online image and self-representation. And, um, and here's a little kind of a uh, brain teaser for you. How would you respond to a rival company's attack ad about your product or company? And uh, I'll, I'll give you a, a hint there, um, which is the cliche or expression that you fight fire with fire. But I think that's all I will say. So with that, I think um, I will turn it over to Q&A. Great. Thank, thank you very much, Ed. And we've been getting some questions coming in. I'd encourage everyone, please, to keep asking questions through, through the panel. And uh, we, we will try to ask a few of those. And we'll continue the discussion on our Facebook page afterwards. And just what you closed by saying there, actually, that was one of the kind of just putting together some of the questions that are coming in. You've illustrated uh, these concepts very much using uh, videos of adverts. And I think there's an understanding that uh, that's a craft where many of these ideas have been perfected over years, and that, as you said, they don't waste a second of, uh, of, of the presentation. Uh, can you say any more that would help us think about how do we uh, take those lessons that are, about, that are illustrated in ads and apply them to either our professional or our business lives? You've given a couple of hints as you were closing up, but maybe you could just expand a little on that. Well, the first thing that I would say is that the use of video in a variety of contexts uh, is rapidly increasing in almost all areas of industry right now. And when I mean video, I'm talking about uh, training videos. I'm talking about internal videos that are designed for um, everything from boosting morale uh, to you know, teaching it about, uh, again, training type issues. And so I think to, to recognize that that's a really powerful medium. And I've been talking a lot about how that represents people, but there's also messages that are going along with that. So if you want to encourage um, people about uh, an employee workforce, for example, uh, about a particular set of behaviors you want to either encourage or discourage, don't just tell, show. That's what the visual channel allows you to do is to show, not just tell. And the reason that's important is because it will have a longer lasting effect. So you know, in other words, as this is one of the points that I, I spend a lot of time on in the, the two-day class, which is when you formulate messages, you want to think about uh, who your audience is and what the most appropriate channel or medium for that message is. Sometimes it's an email. But in other times, you might think today about putting together a visual message because it's not that hard anymore, and it potentially could be more effective for your particular goals, whatever those goals may be. Great. Thank you. That's helpful. Could you take us back to the side head dip? You, you, meant, you said that you got some uh, further comment that you were going to make about that. Maybe this would be a good time. Sure. Well, it, where some people in the audience might recognize that from is it, it, it tends to be considered a, a somewhat feminine pose. And uh, I, you know, I realize I'm 
older than the average person listening today. Um, but when I was in high school, it was almost a ridiculous how consistently guys were told to look straight at the camera and then women, the photographer would reach forward and tilt their head to uh, strike a more feminine pose. Well, it's not just associated with gender, it's also associated with how direct it is and whether or not it's a more coy uh, pose. And so that, uh, that head tilt does have, uh, in many societies, a gendered uh, dimension to it. It is we don't know for sure that for this, but we, we think that this actually uh, may be evolutionary because the head tilt exposes the jugular. It is a submissive pose to take as opposed to you know, looking someone straight in, in the eye. And uh, that's worth knowing because uh, I've had uh, female professionals in my classes who, uh, after hearing this lecture in particular, immediately go home and change the pictures that they have of themselves because they realize that the, the way they were presenting themselves uh, through their websites or whatever was not the person that they wanted to be seen as. So, you know, that head tilt for men might be a way to kind of lessen their assertiveness in some context, but for women it may be a pose you, you may want in a business context at least to avoid. That sounds also like you know, we're potentially getting into territory where people may become concerned about bias and discrimination, whether it's through those kind of attributes that you're describing or actually even more overt signals, whether it's uh, race or gender or, or, or other things. Can we, are, are these just basic inescapable human realities? Can we reprogram our responses to these things? What, what are your views on that? Well. Um, First of all, absolutely, there are uh, the reactions that we have to visual images are often so fast that if we have been brought up or socialized with certain biases, um, that's a place where they're going to kick in. And you know, we can certainly hope that that can change over time. But it's also something to kind of keep in mind uh, if if I'm a uh, uh, a minority member, you know. Uh, and I have to worry about that on top of everything else, well, what do I do? Are there things that I can do? And the answer is, at least in some contexts, there may be. Uh, it's a cliche uh, to beat all cliches, but putting on a pair of glasses, whether you need it or not, uh, conveys a different kind of uh, image. Um, and certainly, uh, how we dress in, in, in professional context is a code that everyone recognizes and understands immediately. So um, I, I have a whole other presentation about how we can decrease prejudice through television, but we don't have time for that today. But we at least lead to recognize that, yes, people decode things almost instantly, and therefore we need to influence that the best we can. So I've had a few people going back to the question of what constitutes visual versus written and asked something which I think is quite interesting that isn't there a sense in which the printed word, for example, if you're looking at it on a PowerPoint slide, is itself visual? Uh, and does that extend also to even to languages perhaps where uh, the presentation of the language itself is much more visual than, uh, than that? I'm going to break that into two questions. We do know that in terms of, of reading, it activate, reading words activates a different part of the brain than looking at a picture of somebody's face. So that's what I mentioned earlier about how different parts of the brain are, are affected. It's true that we still we process both of them you know, initially through our eyes, but where it goes from there, if you will, uh, is a different part of the brain. Now, the second question there in terms of, of languages that, that uh, re, you know, rely more on like, ideographic uh, imagery, that's a really good question that I'm, I'm not prepared to answer today, but I, I will, will learn soon and be able to answer that. I suspect the answer is still the same, that it's still, as a written language, still has processed in the same part of the brain that, that English is for English speakers, but I do not know that for certain. And just expanding on that particular sort of question, I think it was also a lead into what might be cultural uh, and sort of geographic differences that people could expect as we have folks from all over the uh, world listening to this webinar. And one very interesting line of questions as well was, have, has your opinion changed over time or do you think opinions change over time? That some of the ads that you were showing, some of the questions were saying, you know, if we showed that ad now, it would have a very different response to what it did in the election 
that it was part of. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Our sensibility of what, uh, I mean, the, the, the uh, Daisy commercial would not be effective today, and it was controversial in 1964. So absolutely, our aesthetics and our notion of what uh, appropriate representations are changes dramatically. If you have time to waste, you know, go to YouTube and Google 1950s TV commercials, and they will be laughable in terms of how they present consumers, um, especially women uh, as consumers. But the other point that you made in terms of cultural diversity, uh, I want to mention two things. One is, is that the meaning of most facial expressions uh, is, in fact, universal. So uh, uh, you can recognize somebody who's angry in any part of the world. Um, that's pretty uh, hardwired in us. But once we get past that, it does get trickier. Um, and I think, therefore, when you think about the particular audience, that your images are being portrayed to, you do need to think about that. You, need to, you do need to keep that in mind. And just as I said earlier, you shouldn't be your own judge of what your picture looks like. Uh, you want to also try to identify audience, or kind of, if you will, a test focus group that represents the geography and the culture that you are ultimately trying to persuade, because there will be cultural differences. That's more apparent, actually, in nonverbal. How far you stand from somebody in Germany is very different than how close you would stand to them in Latin America. Um, but that's all. there will also be some cultural differences in terms of how um, some stuff is represented. Now, I actually think we overstate that sometimes. There's no way that anybody's going to confuse the Obamaville commercial with being anything other than in an attempt to scare us. And uh, I think that's true, actually, with a lot of the messages. But nonetheless, how recognizable certain characters are, are people in on the joke, things of that sort, that really will be culturally specific. Great. Thank you. That actually answered a number of other questions that were coming in. I think as we're just drawing to the, to, to the top of the hour, uh, we've also had a lot of people asking, you know, finding this very fascinating and asking what, how else they can learn more about uh, these ideas. And I think if we move on to the next slide, perhaps we have uh, some uh, suggestions for readings. And we will be distributing these, uh, uh, the, the, the video of this, and so you'll be able to see these materials uh, later on. Here's some uh, suggested reading. Of course, it would uh, it behooves me to mention, as I did at the beginning, that, uh, that, that Professor Schiappa also teaches in our two-day open enrollment course here at MIT Sloan on communication and persuasion uh, in the digital age, uh, which I think is, we have details of that on the next slide. Uh, and uh, here I think also we have a, uh, there we go, we, there was a link to the presentation. Here's the details of the course. Uh, perhaps in closing, we have about a minute left. Uh, you've uh, uh, put me on the spot a couple of times during this presentation, so let me put you on the spot one final time and say if there was one single thing that people watching this presentation could go away and do you know, right away as soon as they close their browser or maybe when they go into the office the next morning, uh, what would that be? I think the easiest thing is to grab the most earnest and frank uh, colleague that you have and have them sit down and look at your picture on the web and say, what does this say to you? And to do what kind of what we did at the beginning there, with I gave you a menu of four options. Now, give a person like that the, the, a variety of options. Don't do it yourself. Have somebody uh, else who uh, will decode that image. I think that's something that uh, every single person should do is, is think about how they and, for that matter, fellow employees are being represented uh, through the web, since that's the way so much business is encountered these days. Thank you. That's, that's great advice. And we're now going to move uh, everyone onto the Facebook portion of our, of our chat. Uh, and uh, if we would, please just push the slide that will give everyone the link to the Facebook uh, discussion. Uh, we'll be here for the, uh, another 30, half an hour, uh, 30 minutes, uh, to continue to ask, answer questions. We have some very interesting ones coming in. We'll try to answer some more of those. And if you have any further ones, please uh, come to the Facebook chat. Once again, thank you for this portion, Ed, and we'll see everyone momentarily, hopefully, on Facebook. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks to all of our participants for joining us today. In a brief moment, a link to the Facebook discussion with Professor Schiappa will appear on your screen. We hope you found this webcast presentation informative. This concludes our webcast. You may now disconnect. Have a good day.